Good afternoon from Kingston, Ontario. My name is Neil Bierce, and today I will be moderating today's session entitled The Five Most Critical Decisions You'll Make as an Entrepreneur. I will be joined shortly by Dr. Elspeth Murray, but first of all, I'm going to cover some of the early housekeeping that's uh, generally going to be most people's uh, most pressing question. First of all, you can share the invitations to these QFB Insight webinars with a friend or a colleague. We have a sign-up sheet, a, a form available at qsb.ca slash webinars, very simple to fill out. And if, once you submit your email address there, you'll be invited to each of the sessions that we run. We run them monthly on a variety of business topics, and they are always free of charge. Secondly, we do record each and every one of these sessions, including the Q&A at the end, and those will be available on our qsbinsight.com platform. So the, the shortcut to get there is use the exact same link that you use to register for today's session, and the video will be there in about two to three days' time. But we also will send an email to everyone uh, with that link in, again, probably two to three days' time, probably early next week. And uh, just make sure that if you have a colleague who didn't register or you know someone who did register but couldn't attend today, they'll be receiving a copy of that recording. If you have a question during today's session, please don't wait until the very, very end because that makes moderation difficult and I always feel bad if I can't get to every single one of the questions. So please ask at any point during the presentation. Use the right-hand side of your event center window and uh, address them to myself and I'll make sure that we get them triaged and passed across the table to Elspeth. And also, if you are a Twitter user and you'd like to tweet out salient points from today's session for folks who couldn't be in the room with you, Please use and follow along with the hashtag QSB webinar, and we'll be tweeting out things from there as well using our QSB Insight Twitter account. Uh, if you have any sort of technical difficulties throughout the presentation, generally the most common one is that audio drops out momentarily, and uh, I encourage you to understand that it generally is momentarily, so usually just take a pause, take a breath, and it will come back on its own. But otherwise, if it doesn't, please get in touch with me, Neil Beers, on the right-hand side of your window, and I will um, either troubleshoot it or let you in on the uh, telephone broadcast, which is sometimes more stable. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's session leader, Dr. Elspeth Murray. She is the Associate Dean of MBA Programs here at Queen's School of Business and CIBC Faculty Fellow in Entrepreneurship. As well, she leads the School Center for Business Venturing. In this role, she spearheaded the development of the Dare to Dream Internship Program designed to kickstart graduate entrepreneurial ventures and the Tricolor Fund, a student-led early stage investment fund. The new venture management course that she developed has been recognized by Bloomberg Business Week as one of the world's top 10 executive MBA courses. Additionally, she serves as director of Partech, the commercialization organization for Queen's University. She's also co-author of Fast Forward, Organizational Change in 100 Days with Dr. Peter Richardson. So with that, I'm going to pass things across the table and have a great session, and I'll be here for any technical support. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Neil, and uh, welcome to everyone. We have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I hope got a great uh, conversation lined up for you folks, about 45 minutes or so covering the uh, various topics, and then we'll have time, as Neil said, for some Q&A. Um, so here's our agenda for the day. And, uh, you know, I have spent a number of years in the world of entrepreneurship and in the courses that I teach, you know, we cover a lot of basic material, important material, uh, and those sorts of things. But um, I thought it would be really interesting to take a slightly different tack on discussing new venture success and really the, the material that I'd like to cover today uh, is really related to when you talk to successful entrepreneurs and those who have less, been less successful, you know, they always reflect on things that I wish I'd done differently. So that's where the five critical decisions comes from. And um, we will cover each one of them in order. And I hope to cover not just the basics, um, but some of the nuances and the tips and tricks from the trade, so to speak that uh, can, help you, can help make you that much better. So first up, and even before we get to that list, um, you know, you, you can't have a discussion about building your team or investors or capital structure unless you've got some of the, the hygiene factors or, or table stakes things covered off. 
So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on a few of these, but I thought it would be useful to just remind people that, you know, at the core of, um, of any successful venture are a couple of things. One is that there's actually a viable opportunity, and number two is uh, that, that you really have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So I'm going to zip through some of this quickly so that we can make sure we have time in some of those, uh, those key decisions. This is a framework that I use for a first-level screen on whether or not it's even worth um, thinking about those big decisions. In other words, do you have something that can possibly work? So really four categories of, of information, no matter what kind of business plan software you look at or any kind of uh, screening tool. But if you boil it all down, there are really four key questions to answer this, do I have a, a real opportunity question. Is there a real problem that you're solving? Who has that problem? How many people have that problem? Um, and we will come back to this when we talk about uh, the core aspects or core characteristics of successful entrepreneurs. They get it, they see it, they define the problem in the right way. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, the second point too, the window of opportunity has to be just right. Not too early, not too late. If you look at, um, and because I can't see anybody and you can't actually see me, I have no idea how this might relate. Uh, but um, you look at the exploding world of diets and solutions to the obesity problem. So obviously the timing is right. Obviously there are, are real problems, but there are many different solutions to different aspects of the problem. You know, Weight Watchers solves the simplicity problem. All I have to do is count points. I don't have to count calories. I don't have to do anything else. It's just... You know, that chocolate cupcake is a bazillion points. Do I really want to do that, or do I want to have that glass of wine? You've got the Jenny Craig diet, which solves a slightly different problem, and that's convenience in terms of prepackaged food. Uh, you've got, yeah, at the other end of the spectrum, Dr. Bernstein, which is the not quite to take a pill and solve the problem, but injections, B12, medical supervision. I think you get my point here. So those are great opportunities typically going forward because the window is absolutely wide open at this point in time and there are different nuances in terms of customers and the particular problems that uh, they're looking to have solved. The third item always under consideration is that you can actually make money and uh, the key word here is great opportunities have robust and forgiving characteristics. So fat margins, multiple revenue streams, costs that are variable instead of fixed, so on and so forth. And then the very last piece, which will be our segue into talking about entrepreneurs and ultimately the team, is that all of the other items fit well with the founders, the entrepreneurs, and then any management that might come in um, alongside them. <clears throat> there are obviously tons of details around each one of these points, um, but whenever I meet entrepreneurs, I always ask them, tell me why this is a great opportunity and it's even worth having a subsequent conversation. So, second point here in terms of table stakes or what I refer to as sort of the hygiene factor is that when you embark on any new venture, you actually have what it takes. Or if you're going to be investing in somebody else's venture, that you have a clear view of whether or not you're actually dealing with a real entrepreneur or someone who's just in sort of the, the wannabe category. These slides I am going to zip through quickly, um, mostly because uh, what I will do is email out to everyone uh, an assessment tool that we use on our MBA program. They go through each and every one of these categories and give you a chance to determine whether or not you've got what it takes or someone you're dealing with, whether they have it. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of key points here to give you some sense for, um, for really what those critical elements are that you look for. And the other aspect of this is that there is no score here. There is no definitive study that says, yes, if you, you know, get five out of five on each one of these points, yeah, you're going to make it. 
this list is a result of about 150 different studies that were rolled up into one um, with a search for sort of patterns of successful entrepreneurs versus those that aren't, what do they share in common? So I would highlight under commitment and determination uh, the absolute total immersion in the business and having a passion for what it is that you're doing. We have a great line in the world of new ventures, money is a way of keeping score, it's a bad motivator for an entrepreneur. Um, so I always ask the, the why question, why are you doing it? You know, what is the problem that you're solving? Why is this an important problem? What does it mean to you? And how do I know that you're so passionate about this? You're not going to bail when the going gets tough. Persistence is obviously a critical one. And I think another one that's actually not on this chart is uh, another hallmark of successful entrepreneurs is they are 100% A-OK -okay with delayed gratification. So it's rarely that you see you know, massive returns on all of your efforts, uh, quick like a bunny, so to speak. So that ability to actually say one day this will all work out is a hallmark. Under the courage um, category, I would highlight um, what I see in many of the, the entrepreneurs that I deal with who I, I think are, are doing well is this notion of fearless experimentation. You know, you're, you're never afraid to try something. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, who cares? You know, it's just uh, another problem to be solved. Moving on to another very important um, part of what makes for successful entrepreneurs, under this opportunity obsession uh, category, <clears throat> I, cannot over, I cannot overemphasize um, enough the importance of being plugged in to the ecosystem and the cool face where you're dealing with the customer. You know, back to my weight loss example here. It's, you know, talking to people who are trying to lose weight, who are saying things like, man, it's just so complicated. I don't have time to count cal. I don't like the app. I don't like any of this stuff. It's just like, make it simple. It's like, fine. We are going to assign numbers to various products, and all you have to do is count those things. There is great um, video that I show in my EMBA class to drive home this opportunity obsession and, and the customer connected this point. And it's uh, a guy by the name of uh, Richard Davis who founded a company called Second Chance Body Armor. So he makes bulletproof vests. And his critical insight and why he was enormously successful is that he realized that the problem to be solved and the customer need was surprisingly not that it stops the bullet only. That was obviously required. But the real problem to be solved was that the vest had to be comfortable enough to wear every day, all day, and solve the problem. And because of that focus on comfort, he went from zero to 60 almost overnight. And you would be hard pressed to find someone in law enforcement or even in the military who doesn't actually call their bulletproof vest by the particular brand name of that company, which is uh, Second Chance. Um, under the tolerance of risk, ambiguity, and uncertainty, boy, this, this, and, uh, this whole category is the great undoer for many entrepreneurs um, or would-be entrepreneurs. Most successful entrepreneurs are very calculated risk takers. They are comfortable taking risk. They are not paralyzed by it, but they actively seek to risk or reduce every day, every moment, every hour, every second. I think you get the picture. I think the only other thing that I might highlight that's not obvious on uh, this slide is the notion of resilience. So being able to have um, things not quite work out, pick it up, figure out what to do next, and quite comfortable with things like not having enough money in the bank to make payroll, but believing that something will work out and you will solve the problem. And I think one of the last uh, second last category um, that we would cover uh, under creativity, self-reliance, and the ability to adapt, and that I would highlight here is this notion of a helicopter mind. Great entrepreneurs are able to see the forest, talk to the trees. See the forest, talk to the trees. That's what a helicopter mind refers to. So when you think about building your team, if you don't have that ability, if you're the big picture person, who's going to do the details? 
if you're the detailed person who is actually going to help you think about the big picture. And here you see one more time, lack of a fear of failure. Um, motivation to excel. Um, most successful entrepreneurs are quite comfortable starting in the garage, keeping costs low, not uh, having um, a high need for status and power because you don't have that in the early days. And for me personally, this is a real marker that I look for in uh, people who seem to be able to, um, to actually be successful is that they are, uh, they are okay with not having uh, the big office, all the ceiling tiles, et cetera, et cetera. Self-awareness is a gift, and that's the last one that I would highlight on here, and that um, spins out into everything else that we will talk about. And the very last category here um, is an important one, and what does leadership actually mean? Boy, we could spend hours and hours on this. I would highlight one bullet point here in particular, and that's an internal locus of control. And really what that means is that most successful entrepreneurs believe they can control their own destiny, that they can actually change the context in which the business operates. And it is that eternal optimism, that glass is half full, that really leads into um, what we're going to talk about mostly on, uh, in this webinar, which is what some of those big decisions are. Last slide before we get to those, and um, a very important one. So you have a viable business opportunity. You have what it takes. Have you had that conversation with yourself about what your, your goals are? Personal goals and financial goals, how they go hand in hand. So why are you in the business, and what do you hope to gain from it? Back to Richard Davis and Second Chance Body Armor. He uh, was running a pizza shop. He was uh, held up one night, shot a couple of times, almost died, lying in the hospital bed, thinking about there's got to be a better way. Comes up with the idea for, as he describes it, everyday body armor. Uh, gets some ballistic nylon, creates this unbelievable product um, that saves lives, and that's why he actually started the business. So his personal goals were not related to fame, thrill, anything else. It was about saving lives and creating a business that would employ people in his local community, which goes hand in hand with his, with his financial goals. He made a lot of money at the end of the day, but it wasn't about doing it quickly. He reinvested in the business every cent he made for many years. Um, and really, the last point that I would make here is clarity around the why you are doing this is a critical element in helping you answer the rest of the questions. Speaking of which, decision number one that materially impacts your business and on the list of, gee, I wish I'd spent more time thinking about this, is building your team. There is a ton of stuff written about teams and new venture teams. Um, and let's start off by sort of talking about uh, what the team is all about. Ultimately, it's about the ability of a group of people to execute against the opportunity. And this group of people includes founders, management, advisors, key employees, you name it. But it is really about the fit and the ability to execute against a particular opportunity. Not everyone's going to be thrilled and equally able to, to uh, you know, solve the, the weight loss um, problem. Um, not everyone is going to be equally able to execute against a uh, – a um, sturgeon farm that uh, is in the farm's caviar business. And uh, a couple of uh, former students of mine actually scoped out a fantastic opportunity to do just that. And the more power to them realized that uh, they could execute against a lot of things, but not against that particular, um, against that particular business. So when you look at, you know, in an ideal world and creating a team, you know, here's the throwaway that's on every website. You know, you want people who know it all, they know everyone, they are known for everything, great reputation, fame. You got a team that actually works really well together, and you've got a team that's going to be committed to kind of stick it out um, through thick and thin. So really easy to talk about, very difficult to actually ascertain in practice, which brings me to the next slide here. 
So when you think it's, and I, I guess, you know, maybe it's worth repeating, business success is all about the team. And most successful investors in new ventures will tell you that on that list of how do you scope out a, a great opportunity, the thing they spend most time on is the team. Because great teams will roll with the punches. Great teams will, in fact, stick it out through thick and thin. Great teams will not implode um, because personalities get in the way because there's some, you know, larger issue or, or mission for the company. But how do you actually figure that out? How do you figure out what the secret sauce is going to be? So markers for looking at people who will be really great team members in a new venture. The first one is obvious. They've done it before. The second one is that they have some obvious commitments, skin in the game. So it could be cash, you know, opportunities that they could have taken that they chose not to in, in other companies or other businesses. You know, that they've actually worked successfully together in a team environment. You know, at Queens and uh, the MBA programs, they're, they're team-based. And so, uh, and anybody who's been through any of the programs will tell you that, uh, you know, you're under pressure, you've got assignments, you've got work, you're juggling a bunch of stuff. You know, you can perform in that environment. You can pretty much do anything. You know, you want people who have powerful networks. So you look at the schools they went to, um, people who work for name brand companies. I have got uh, a couple of former students who created a really cool company called Fitness, and they make a, um, a desk that uh, sits on top of treadmills. I can hardly wait to get mine. Uh, Laurel Walzak and Ron Bateen um, met here uh, at Queen's. Uh, they weren't even on the same team. They were chatting about, um, you know, things that they're passionate about and literally, you know, over a beer in the pub and uh, started to cook up this idea for the treadmill desk. And uh, Ron's in oil and gas. Laurel worked for many years in marketing at the NHL. Um, so on the name brand company end of things, you know, you start to see how these things come together. Ron's got experience in startups and oil and gas. Um, you know, treadmill dusts are a little bit different, but he's still sort of seen the movie before. Uh, and they got to know one another literally in the, you know, in the trenches in the program and are off and running. And I think the last thing that I sometimes look for is, uh, you know, people who are able to attract outside advisors um, and kind of combine the team uh, as well. So my point here is that Thinking very carefully about some of these markers almost always helps you avoid critical problems a little bit later on. You may look at this list and say, wow, you know, I'm young, or this is the first time for me, I don't kind of have all this stuff. You know, I know a lot of stuff. I've been in oil and gas for a long time, but I, I sure don't know, uh, you know, the world of fitness. So you can sometimes round that out um, with people, but the reality is that you often have gaps where, when you start, and that's okay. But the key here is to look for evidence, or in your own world, if you are doing this yourself, be able to provide evidence that you know what the gaps are and that somehow you can fill them with really good people. Now, the last kind of point that I wanted to make on, on the team front and when people do reflect on, wow, you know, I wish I'd done it differently, rarely do people say, gee, I wish I didn't go into business, you know, um, with Fred. Oftentimes they say, gee, I wish I didn't go into business with my brother or my sister or my brother-in-law. Um, the reality is that, uh, or, or a friend, the reality is that most new ventures are created through leveraging a personal network could be family, could be friends, not perfect, um, but often it's the only way to get started because you have a chicken and egg problem. Uh, you know you need more talented people perhaps, but you can't attract more talented people because you haven't really got anything. Um, so the key aspect of this and, and really what is, quote, normal is that you start off with friends or family and you get more sophisticated as things go along. Key here is to set expectations clearly right up front. Think about some of the material that we've just gone through. Why are you doing it? What's the end game? What kind of money are you talking about? Uh, those sorts of things. And, and really 
make sure that you know you you start to think about that that chemistry end of things. And my best piece of advice for you is that when you are building a team and talking about who is going to do what and how this is all going to work, write it down. Capture it somewhere on a piece of paper so that you can, a napkin, it doesn't matter, um, so that you can constantly remind yourselves and everybody else, you know, this is why we're doing it. And one thing, so a couple of things to just close off this part of the discussion. Uh, there is a terrific book called Startup Nation. And it is the story of why a disproportionate number of startups that come from Israel uh, are successful. And if and or when um, you read the book, uh, one of the key takeaways is that one of the reasons these companies are so successful is the quality of the team. Smart people who know a lot, but it's mostly about the cohesion of those teams. And part of the reason for that is the requirement for mandatory military service. So you literally know who you want to be in that foxhole with because you have observed people under very trying circumstances and you can choose very well early on. And that is really my, my last point here. And a startup that I'm um, working with right at the moment, we are very careful with always thinking about the next hire. Who do we need? When do we need them? Who is the best candidate? And then what we do with every person is we test them. Before we dish out equity, before we pay a lot of cash, before we do anything, we give them a trial period, and we are really clear on that. And I speak from personal experience when I tell you that we had a guy who looked fantastic on paper, had worked for a big technology company. You know, really, I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, we're able to attract this guy. He was a disaster. Within about two weeks, everybody hated him, and, uh, and so we said, thanks very much. Um, you know, we tried you out. He did it for free. Everybody wants to work for a startup, especially a really cool one. So we said, you want to come work for us? You know, uh, come and spend a couple of weeks, and we'll just see it out. So my last point here is just ask. So try people out. Make sure that they don't expect anything, and you will save yourself a lot of grief um, and a lot of cash, in particular, a little bit later on. Okay, um, decision number two in the wish I'd done it differently category. Thinking about setting up your capital structure, which is also known as dividing the pie. And dividing the pie is really about who gets what slice of equity in your business. It is a painful discussion to have because you have to be brutally honest and um, people sort of say, well, we'll get to that or, you know, it's, it's, you know, we'll just kind of, we'll talk about it at some point or they satisfy um, and it's almost always a mistake. And when you think about dividing the pie, dividing the pie and dishing out equity is fundamentally about two things, aligning people's efforts and who has control of the company. There are other aspects of control, boards of directors, bylaws, a bunch of other things that we are not going to talk about here, um, but just really about the, the capital structure itself. Two common mistakes I hear from, from people, creating a very complex structure right up front by handing out bits and pieces of equity in lieu of cash. So you give your landlord 2%, you pay your lawyer 2%, you give your accountant 1%, and before you know it, and you're bringing in money from the outside, before you know it, you have 49 investors and it's an administrative nightmare. And I'm sure most of you are aware that we have a rule that anytime you get beyond 50 shareholders, you're into a whole different category of, um, of regulatory oversight. And if you expect to bring in any outside capital, the complexity creates problems for future investors. I know of many angel investors and VCs who will look at a startup company that has, you know, 27 and a half unrelated investors, and they basically say, look, you've got to clean that up before we put any money in because this is a nightmare. So that's number one. Number two is, uh, under the common mistakes is, 
not thinking through the end game and how the who has what slice of the pie will change over time. So we're going to spend some time on this latter point because it is um, one of the questions I get all the time and it is one of the mistakes that, that many entrepreneurs make. So whenever you sit down and you think about your company, it is always worth something. And at the end of the day, it is often only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. So let's assume, um, by way of simple example, that we have three founders. You know, they've each put in 33 bucks or some variation on that, but they've decided that Fred is going to own 50% of the company, Susan is going to own 20%, and Jim is going to own 30%. So you got 100% of the pie. So things were really good. Um, you know, you just kind of did it because Fred put in, you know, 50 bucks, Susan put in 20 bucks, and Jim put in 30 bucks, which, by the way, is a very crude way of divvying up the pie and not something I would recommend. In any case, um, three of them sit down and say, wow, we need more money. Go hunting for an investor. The investor says he'll give you 100 bucks, but in order to meet his you know, return expectations on that investment, he says, I need 50% of the company in exchange. You need the money, you take the deal. So this is what happens, and this is what we refer to as dilution. And this is really the point about thinking about the end game. So if somebody comes in and says they want 50% of your company, that means there is only 50% left over for the rest of you. So everybody's slice of the pie gets diluted, by 50% or cut in half. So the company is now worth $200 because it was $100. $100 came in, so now it's worth $200. But you have experienced dilution. So Fred no longer has 50% of the, the company. He has 25. Susan's been cut in half. Jim's been cut in half. Then you realize, wow, holy mackerel, or something like that. You know, you need more money. You have another new investor. She comes in and says, geez, you know, I want 50% of the company in exchange for the 100 bucks I'm going to give you. You know what happens next. The new investor has 50% of the company, and everybody else gets diluted one more time by a half. So Fred's now down to 12.5%. You can see how the slices of the pie change. So, you know, one of the things that often happens, and, you know, this, uh, this is a real-life situation, you know, investor one is fine because he anticipated dilution. Fred is okay because he's still got 12.5%. Jim is a little bit ticked because uh, he thought he'd have a whole lot more. Susan is totally disgusted and has quit to work elsewhere. And I see this happen all the time in new businesses um, when, you know, it takes a little bit longer to get things done, takes a little bit more money than you thought, uh, and before you know it, you have a situation where people's interests are not aligned and their efforts are not aligned with what actually has to happen to drive the business forward. So there's a lot more, again, in terms of understanding dilution, but the math is pretty simple. And my best advice to you on this front is sit down, anticipate what the end game is. In other words, how much of the pie will each person need when all is said and done um, in order to work hard to make the company a success. And then you work backwards and you say, okay, how many rounds of financing might we need? And run some scenarios. Is it two rounds? Is it three rounds? You know, and, and work from the end back to the beginning and, uh, and see where people need to start off with in order for everything to work out. And my final piece of advice is really related to keeping the number of investors to a minimum. Any of you who have ever had to track down investors to sign anything for any simple matter will know that if you've got 29, 30 different people to manage, um, it's a nightmare. And there are many different structures and, and ways in which you can have a bunch of people connected to your business and invested in your business without having them operate as individual shareholders. So having said, start with the end game and working backwards. 
there are many ways in which you can think about splitting the equity initially. Could be money contributed. I'm not going to read the whole list here, but my point is that you want to sit down and have a very holistic view of how you are going to divvy up the slice of the pie. And I would suggest that you don't do it on the basis of solely money coming in. Um, there are other more sophisticated ways in which you can actually have people feel that they have the right slice of the pie that's commensurate with how much commitment, how much money, you know, um, foregone opportunities, those kinds of things. And I am frequently asked, what does a good capital structure look like? And often I start the discussion off saying, at the end of the day, when the business is up for sale, someone acquires it, you know, you go for an IPO. What you often like to see is that the founders have a third. ESOP is the employee stock option plan. All the employees who have to help you make the business a success have about a third. And then if you have outside investors, they have a, a third. And uh, human nature, that seems to be one in which you can align interests. Okay, um, the next thing in the wish I'd done this category is leveraging an advisory board. I often advise entrepreneurs, especially those that are first-time entrepreneurs or they have gaps in capabilities, um, you know, they're manufacturing a product but nobody on the team has any manufacturing expertise, or you're, you know, doing um, – um, medical startup, med tech or biotech, um, and nobody, you know, on the team has regulatory approval expertise. You can fill those gaps and do a whole bunch of other things uh, by um, use of an advisory board. So these are people who do not have any fiduciary responsibility. Uh, they are not. They are not part of the board that is required, you know, uh, legally. These are individuals that you put together who can help you, who can do a number of things for you. And uh, I did a study a number of years ago on advisory boards, and you can read the list here of all the potential contributions. So that's the theory part of it. Everything from a sounding board, new ideas, mentoring, business connections, you name it. That's the theory. The actual contributions of an advisory board same items, slightly different order. So you can see that mentoring, new ideas, sounding board are sort of still up there, but other vaults from almost the end into number five position. And in that other category is what I refer to as support in dark moments. These are people who've seen the movie before. These are people who will help you. These are people who don't have a vested interest necessarily, but um, you can call up and say, look, you know, I'm having a bad day, um, and they will settle you down and say, you know, don't worry, here's what I did, or let me help you solve the problem. I often suggest that you, you treat advisors um, in two ways. People are individual advisors are going to help you with individual problems, but it's always a great organizational discipline to actually treat them as if they were a board of directors. What I mean by that is regular meetings, reviewing financials to the extent uh, that you might want to do that, but basically it forces you to have milestones that you report out on, things like that. Um, so individual help and then kind of professionalizing or, or creating a real organization. I always get asked, <coughs> how do you find advisors? Um, and you can see kind of the order here. It's often through your personal network, referrals, former colleagues. Sometimes you have investors. And in another company I've, I'm involved in, one of the angel investors is, is on the advisory board. In some businesses, you actually have two different advisory boards, you know, a scientific advisory board and a business advisory board. Um, you know, and number three, I would come back to, um, you know, another point that I want to make here is that just ask. You will be pleasantly surprised that uh, you can ask very powerful, well-connected, very smart people if they'd like to lend you a hand. And a lot of people will simply say yes. They're interested in the business. They want to give back. 
there's a cool factor. And one of my favorite stories on this front is a, an Ottawa company called Got Marketing, who managed to line up Cheryl Crow, the musician, um, onto their advisory board. And she, this is a tech startup. Uh, you know, she was not advising on technology, but man, was she ever connected. And uh, an, important, um, an important part of what uh, enabled them to actually recruit a uh, VP of marketing from Yahoo at the time, which was a, a big coup, and that was a Cheryl Crow connection. So just ask. Um, last question, I guess, uh, on uh, advisory boards and creating them is, uh, and really the point of this slide is, the way in which you compensate advisors is all over the map. Everything from fees, you know, per meetings, retainers for well-financed companies, all the way down to things like, you know, let's just get together uh, on a regular basis and we'll have a great meal and uh, a good bottle of wine and then that's good enough. And I always suggest uh, that you, um, and well, I'll back up. You know, the irony here is you, you can never pay an awesome advisor enough for the value they bring, and so often it's, uh, it's not about the money. It's about participating in some upside, some social aspect, you name it. Always just ask the question, you know, why are you doing this and, uh, and what might be meaningful compensation to you? Okay, last uh, couple of big questions um, that I'd like to hopefully give you some insight on, uh, bringing in investors. And again, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. What I really wanted to highlight and in the wish I'd done it differently category, uh, I often hear people say, man, oh man, I wish I'd spent more time thinking about how to bootstrap the business so I didn't have to give away slices of the business. You can see some of those um, sources of capital that aren't really bringing in investors under bootstrapping. But more importantly, and this is a very interesting recent phenomenon, is the importance of angels and angel groups. And angel investors are um, high net worth individuals. They've made their money in a variety of different ways. They invest their own money. They're not professional investors. The term angels came from the original investors in Broadway productions not to be confused with any other uh, angle here, um, but they are very entrepreneurial friendly. They invest for reasons other than making a financial return, although that's, that's um, always in the back of their mind. And there has recently been the emergence of so-called super angels, Mark Andreessen, Horowitz, you name it. So these are actually not professional venture firms. They are just really wealthy people who want to give back and, and there's a thrill in investing for them. It is really interesting to look at the stats between um, Canada and the U.S. and also to just talk about some orders of magnitude here. In the U.S. last year, uh, angel investors in, invested $20 billion in businesses. 80% of those funds were in seed or early stage ventures. There are roughly about 260,000 angel investors in the U.S., and interestingly enough, uh, New York has a lot of them, good old Silicon Alley as opposed to Silicon Valley. Invest an average of about $100,000 per startup into, I think last year it was about 60,000 businesses, and angel investment in terms of sheer dollars and impact has surpassed venture capital and professional investing. And a lot of the big VC firms are now, now scrambling to figure out, um, you know, how they kind of maintain the business. As you might imagine, in Canada, the numbers are a little bit different. So uh, total value of investments last year was $89 million, uh, which is not bad. That was up significantly, almost double that from the year before. Uh, so there's been a massive uptick in, uh, in this group. And as I look back, and if you look at some of the evidence related to new venture success, angels are often, <coughs> angel-backed companies um, perform just as well, if not better, than um, companies that are uh, funded by the so-called professional investors. I really like this particular chart when you think about uh, different types of angel investors. 
you know, and obviously the guardian angel is the best type of individual to have invested in your company. They know your industry, they've been in your shoes, they can be helpful on multiple fronts. The least favorable type of angel is in the lower left, that's the financial return angel. Yes, they have a lot of money. Often they've made money not the entrepreneurial route, so wealthy professionals, doctors, lawyers, for example, they don't know your industry, they don't know startups. Uh, yes, they're somewhat entrepreneur friendly, but they're mostly in it for the money. So my point here is I would go after angel investors first and foremost if you're going to bring in investors of any type. They are helpful. They are increasingly more sophisticated. There has been a very virtuous cycle created once again of people making money off of startups and continuing to reinvest. That's part of the magic of Silicon Valley. Um, Sometimes the argument is that they don't push hard enough. They're a bit too friendly. I'm not sure I really buy that. Um, but this is a very important group and an even more important group and source of really good, quote, smart money um, to, uh, to help startups grow beyond the, you know, the seed stage. So how do you find angel investors? A uh, lot of activity in local economic development groups. I'm sitting here in Kingston. We have a local angel group. Uh, in Canada, the, uh, there's the National Angel Capital Organization, so the NACO, uh, which represents some angels, uh, accelerators and incubators are tied in, the Y Combinators of the world, Mars if you're in Toronto, um, most communities have them, and, and ultimately uh, personal networking. As a friend of mine uh, joked, he said, all you have to do is go and hang out where really wealthy people hang out and you'll run into uh, to angel investors. Um, so we used to talk about this group as sort of one of many. Um, this is one that has bubbled up to the top of the list for hopefully the reasons that we have talked about. All right, the last piece that I thought might be helpful to cover in the wish I'd thought about this earlier category, big decisions, is really spending time selecting your strategy. And I'm sure many of you have read um, the book, um, one of Malcolm Gladwell's books where he talks about the 50,000 hours of, uh, of experience. I have a slight variation on that theme, which is really spending time sort of understanding patterns of success. In other words, strategies that work or elements of a strategy that seem to separate the, the winners from the losers. And uh, not that these guarantee success, but it is very interesting to look at the number of companies that have gone really big by doing some of these things. Uh, start with an MVP, not to be confused with that minimally, or not to be confused with most valuable player. Um, if you haven't already read a book by Eric Ries called The Lean Startup, I would encourage you to do so. Concept here is get something that's good enough get it out there, iterate quickly and refine it on the fly. I have um, a couple of former students who created a really cool company called Bytopia.ca. They uh, just uh, created a, a spin out of that, something called Snap Saved, which was just scooped up by Groupon. Uh, and if you saw their first website, you would be appalled. Um, but they wanted to get it out there. This is a very sophisticated uh, somewhat like Groupon, but a little bit distinct. Uh, they just wanted to test and see if anybody would care, and they got tremendous feedback. They hired a firm in India. They created version two really quickly uh, and got it out there and continued to build a business. One of the problems with a lot of organizations on the strategy end is that they spend too long perfecting their initial product. They never get it out the door, uh, and, and they miss the window of opportunity. Another hallmark of uh, great strategies is that they're simple. When I have, uh, when it takes, you know, 55 slides to actually explain someone's strategy, that's in the other spectrum from simplicity. So if you look at companies that have, have done this exceptionally well, the original iPod and Google, if you have not seen Steve Jobs' original launch of the iPod, Google it, have a look at it, master of simplicity. You know, other great strategies, um, you know, the customer sells. So your cost of customer acquisition is low. 
you know, fax machine, Skype, Facebook, Snapchat, um, you name it. Um, so you don't have to expend money on building that critical mass. Somebody else does it for you. You know, a tried and tested model for a long time is that somebody else pays. So worked for newspapers for a long time. Uh, you know, no one here, you know, pays for Google. I think, I think you get the story. So giving some thought to, uh, to somebody else paying for at least a portion of it. I think a very interesting pattern of success is this concept of drafting a partner or having a big brother or big sister. Uh, so who do you want to hitch your wagon to? Who will drag you along? Who will expend cash on, you know, creating um, relationships with customers and you will be able to literally draft off of that for you cyclists out there. These days in the world of the Internet, you know, we talk about going viral. Uh, it is really easy to do that. And, uh, you know, think about in your strategy, you know, how you might be able to do that. Who will tweet about you? You know, how will, you know, who will post a YouTube video about you? And I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with everything from American Idol to, uh, to you name it. I always uh, um, am a bit hesitant to say, yeah, first mover advantage wins the day. Sometimes it does matter. You get a brand, you get a, a technology, you get a patent, you get a, you know, the big first customer or partner um, before anybody else. Uh, but you have to be really careful with that one. You know, I often think that if you look at companies that are successful, they often have a discernible unfair advantage, you know, a better network, uh, someone who's more famous, uh, proprietary knowledge. You know, Microsoft won in the early days because they had more money than anybody else. So they bought up competitors. They, you know, crushed businesses that got close to them, and that was part of their strategy, and, and they had the money to do it. And I guess the last point here is always think about who else around you um, can help you out. And this is a mistake that Apple made in the early days of the uh, personal computer. They kept it all to themselves. They never created that ecosystem around them. The IBM... Um, Windows combo did the exact opposite. Steve Jobs learned his lesson the hard way, and he has seen a completely different approach to iPods and app developers, uh, you name it. And one of the reasons Twitter won is um, because they hit so-called ecosystem status before anybody else. All right, that is a uh, quick pass through some of the critical decisions and um, you know, things that uh, wished we'd done differently. There's obviously a lot more depth to each and every one of these points and the entire courses that we teach on these things, but I hope uh, it's a little bit of a framework and some orientation around some of the things that should bubble up to the top of your list. All right, we have some time for questions. So my very first one here is, what are your thoughts on advisors also being invested in the business with their own dollars? Um, Great question. Um, you want advisors who are going to be objective in giving you advice. So um, they are the ones who will talk to you on this. The best advisors, they are not your friends. They are not your neighbors. They are people who will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, what about this? You know, they will call you out on the carpet as need be, you know, they are, they are there to help you along. So this is a longer way of answering your question. The problem with having advisors who are invested in the business is sometimes that objectivity is not there. In other words, they're always thinking about, like, how is this going to impact the slice of the pie, the return, how quickly we exit, those sorts of things. Um, I think maybe at the root of advisors who are invested in the business is that you want to make sure people are aligned and willing to actually put the time and effort into giving you advice, and that can work. Um, but most of the, I'm just going down my list here, most of the advisory boards that I think are, um, are particularly valuable, the advisors are not invested in the business. Um, and again, gross generalization, but uh, hopefully that sort of answers the question about the dilemma 
of objectivity versus having kind of that uh, that commitment. All right. Oh, here's another good one too. Boy, you guys aren't throwing me any uh, softballs here. Okay, this question is: How do you ensure that long-term vision remains intact when a board of advisors or an investor pushes for more short-term revenue? The only way that you can ultimately ensure that your long-term vision remains intact is if you have control over your own destiny when somebody from the outside is pushing you to do something differently. So if, if an advisor is giving you advice on that front and he or she you know, ha has no other venue or avenue other than you know, just giving you that advice and you can politely sort of you know, disagree and go back to the long-term vision, if you, however, have a situation where you have an investor, for example, who has a seat not on an advisory board but on your board, a director who has a vote on things like hiring and firing the CEO or shifting management in and out, you have a slightly different problem. So you've always got to think about, um, you know, if you, if you are a founder and you have a long-term vision and you don't ever want to have, be in a situation where someone can force you to do something in the short term that might impact the long term, then you better make sure you're in a position where you can always make that call. And you can do that in a couple of ways by ensuring you have a big enough piece of the pie for any decisions that might be related to, um, that, that might be for shareholders to vote on but mostly it's around to the board of directors and, and how the power situation works out there. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I fully answered that question, but it sort of brings up another one that I often get, which is, you know, how do you know when really you should abandon the long-term vision because it's no longer viable? As uh, John Kelly, who's a, uh, a great entrepreneur in Ottawa who founded Jetform said, you know, when the horse is dead, dismount. And how do you know when the horse is dead? And so you got to have people who will tap you on the shoulder uh, to tell you that that is the case. So a little bit of a, a sidebar on that one. Okay, so, yeah. For an employerpreneur, when is it the right time to quit your day job to pursue a new venture full-time? So I just had another former student who had a really great job um, at one of the, the, the major banks. Uh, but he'd written a business plan while he was here. This was an educational software, which he was completely passionate about. Uh, but he was doing this, you know, in the evenings, at night, um, very late into the night on weekends. You know, he's taking vacation time off to go and meet with investors. And, then, you know, he was saying, well, how do I know, how do I know when, it, when I can quit? And, and so my advice to him was the following. When you can convince somebody else to invest in your company, who will pay you a salary to quit your day job so that you can live. So, um, you know, his wife worked, which was helpful, uh, but they were expecting a baby, and so it wasn't like he, you know, could continue to work ridiculous hours. So back to uh, angel investors who are your friends, he found a guy who shared the passion in the educational space. He presented his business plan, he shopped it around, he, you know, had friends and people poke holes in it. I uh, got lots of feedback. People said, no, 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 this is great. You know, he had lined up a couple of school boards to pilot some of this stuff. In other words, he had convinced himself uh, and gone beyond paper that this could work out. But it was ultimately when the guy said, uh, the angel investor said, you know, I'm going to give you 500000 bucks to kickstart this thing that he said, okay, you know, that's the last piece. I always view the exercise, by the way, of writing up a business plan, like a deck of slides, whatever that might be, as the ultimate exercise in convincing yourself that uh, you should quit your day job. All right. Um, okay, we've got just a few minutes here, and i got a pile of other questions. Um, okay, what incentives can I use to get high-quality, motivated individuals when I can't pay them much or anything? So in a, uh, another startup that uh, I sit on the advisory board for, we have high-quality motivated individuals who have just recently retired. They don't need the money. They're doing it for other reasons. 
they're doing it for delayed gratification, uh, meaning options later on. But there are three people who are pretty much full-time in the company, and they're doing it for no cash. So uh, if you've got something that's sufficiently exciting, um, that can work very well. But part of it is just the thrill. You know, it's the excitement. It's doing something that's difficult. So, you know, a non-monetary, non-equity incentive is to just have the coolest startup you can imagine. And... Um, and, uh, you know, start to sell some of that magic. Okay, I think we probably have time for um, one last couple more questions. So this is a question about the team. For ideal team members, should one look for those with similar mindsets, better cohesion, or different perspectives, and more diverse? Uh, so as one of my colleagues who specializes in teams is often uh, fond of saying, the best performing teams are diverse and the worst performing teams are diverse. Um, so the magic, I, I often, uh, I use a couple of analogies when I uh, describe the best team. So first of all, I am in the diversity is good camp. I think if everybody thinks the same, if everybody has the same, uh, you know, uh, capabilities or mindsets, then you often lose some of that constructive debate magic. Um, different personalities, different ways of coming at things, you know, the left brain, the right brain. But there is no question that you have to be able to capture that diversity. So, you know, startups are often described, uh, one in particular, no disrespect to teenage boys, but, uh, you know, one of the board members uh, describes to the CEO, remember, you're dealing with a bunch of teenage boys. I talk about thoroughbred racehorses, skittish, opinionated, competitive, high-performing, and that's what you want. Um, and, but you have to constantly keep, um, you know, keep on top of that kind of stuff. More cohesive teams are easier to manage, but oftentimes um, ultimately not all that successful. And, and I guess my last point on here is you have to know what is going to be the critical element for your business. And if having, you know, a group of thoroughbreds is, is what's absolutely required, then if you're the CEO or, or running the company, that's what you've got to spend your time on. Hopefully that answers that. Um, okay, great. Last question, I guess. When should the founder hire a CEO? When the business is about to get beyond them just before that next step function uh, change in the nature of the business. Many, many businesses suffer from founderitis, and what I mean by that is founders who won't let go or don't recognize when it's time to kind of take the next step. I wish I had a really discreet answer to this one, but this, again, is where a group of objective outside advisors who've seen the movie before will tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what, it's time. In order to go to the next level, you know, it, it, it's time. My only other piece of advice on that one, and I think we'll kind of wrap it up and, and call it a day, and apologies to those of you whose questions I wasn't able to get to. Um, there's a great article, a very old article written in 1979 by a great uh, scholar by the name of Larry Greiner, G-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E -E you can get it off... Um, Harvard Business School publishing website. It's called Evolution and Revolution as Organizations Grow. It is the ultimate self-awareness tool and tool with your, your team to actually sit down and say, here are the markers for us taking the next step function. And, you know, I'm not the right person to do it. I don't want to do it. And therefore, it's, it's time to bring in somebody from the outside. There are lots of examples where this works really well, and I guess my last uh, company that, that I, I might call out on this one is a great company, again, in Ottawa called Pythian. They are um, in the business of outsourced database, um, DBA, database administrators. Paul Valet, who is one of the founders, kind of slogged it out, built a, a really great business that was kind of stuck. Uh, until he hired a former VC and a good friend of mine by the name of Andrew Waitman to be the CEO, and the thing's taken off like a rocket. Different stage, different set of skills. Uh, Paul's still heavily involved, but doing what he loves 
and why I started the business in the first place. All right, I think that's uh, all the time we have. Um, Neil, I would throw it over to you. Any last final comments? Thank you very much, everybody. I hope uh, I've given you food for thought, answered some questions, and uh, that our paths will cross again someday for some of you or uh, for the first time um, for the rest of you. So thanks so much. Neil, over to you. All right, thank you. And once again, we had far more questions than we had time to answer. Uh, please remember that this content will be posted to qsbinsight.com in the next couple of days, so you can view the entire video again. And as well, we'll be working as many of these questions as we can into upcoming uh, white papers as well as upcoming additional webinar topics. So please stay subscribed, and if you haven't subscribed yet to receive those updates, please visit qsb.ca slash webinars, and uh, you'll hear first about our next session, which we'll be having next month. With that, we're going to wrap things up. Have a wonderful day, and that's all from Kingston.